On the surface, the 8700G just looks like any other ordinary AM5 CPU. But underneath the hood, it has AMD's most powerful iGPU, the 780M, finally coming to desktop after being exclusive to laptop CPUs. The 780M is no slouch either, coming in with 10 more cores compared to the 7700's iGPU. The 760M and the 8600G also has 6 more GPU cores than the 7700's iGPU, so that's dang impressive. And while we didn't compare the 7700 today, that would be an obvious comparison. We compared the 8700G and 8600G to some of the most popular CPU and GPU combinations, including an AMD Ryzen 3 3100, and a GTX 1050 Ti for a total of $120 USD. We also compared the i3-12100F and the GTX 1650 Super for around $185 US. And for our last combination, we paired the 5600X with the 1660 for around $230 USD. We also compared the i5-13500, which has a UHD 770 in it for good measure, which costs around $250 all up. That being said, the 8700G costs around $330 US, while the 8600G costs around $230 US. So already, some of the used combinations are going to be a lot cheaper than these two APUs, with the 5600X and 1660 combination literally costing around the same. So let's talk about it. Now, the 780M is just like any other iGPU, where your system RAM is going to have a major impact on performance. So because of that, we're using Trident Z5 Neo RGB 6400 mega transfers, 2x16GB RAM for a total of 32GB at CL32. We also use the B650 Aorus Elite AX using the latest BIOS revision which comes with the latest microcode update that fixes the STAPM issue which is basically the skin safe temperature sensor on the CPU that's apparently been fixed in this latest revision which you can confirm here. Now this is for MSI right? It says MSI addresses AMD STAPM issue but you can see here, it looks like MSI has already updated to its latest microcode update, which is 1.1.0.2b, which is the exact same microcode that's listed on Gigabyte's website right here. The rest of the test setup is listed in the description. Anyways, let's get into performance at 720p in rasterization. So you can see in Cyberpunk 2077 720p at the low preset, you can already see that the 5600X plus 1660 combo is going to deliver a much more better gaming experience here. The 1.1% lows are a lot higher as compared to the 780M and 760M. And obviously the average FPS is going to be a lot higher, but in my opinion, 1.1% lows matter a lot more. But it's still a playable experience nonetheless, and it also does get beaten out by the 12100F and 1650 Super. The 780M and 760M do manage to beat out the 1050 Ti combo in average FPS, but 1.1% lows again are higher on the 3100 plus 1050 Ti combo. In Forza Horizon 5 and 720p at the medium preset, the tables turn pretty much, because again 1.1% Sandlers are still lower on the 780M even though the average FPS is higher than the 5600X plus 1660. You can see overall it's a much more consistent experience which matters a lot. This time however the 780M does manage to take hold of the 12100F and 1650 super combo even in 1.1% lows. The 760M and 780M do also take a hold of the 1050Ti combo in 1% lows. Rainbow Six Siege is a lot more of a competitive title which is something more close that you would actually be playing on these IG GPUs. At the low preset with no anti-aliasing, you can see once again it's a more consistent experience overall with the 1660 combo. But this time around the 780M and 760M do manage to take a hold of the GTX 1650 combo, both of them, in 1.1% and and lows. And again the 780M and 760M take a hold of the 1050Ti combo in average FPS. Red Dead Redemption 2 now is 720p at the lowest preset possible. You can see that once again the GTX 1660 combo is going to deliver a much more consistent experience in the 1% lows and the average FPS here. And you can see the 1650 Super combo also takes a hold of the other two APUs. But the 780M and 760M do manage to take a hold of the GTX 1050Ti combo once again. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is 720p at the medium preset TA is pretty much the same here again. 1660 combination takes the hold and 1650 Super follows at a close second but you can see here that the 780M and 760M combos actually again deliver a much better experience in the lows here compared to the 1650 Super. 
which might be because we are slightly becoming CPU limited here because this is a quad core CPU. You can see that the lows pretty much match up here with the 3100's lows indicating that we are kind of CPU limited here. But it's still a great combination in terms of value anyway, delivering a much higher average FPS here compared to the two APUs. So all in all, the i3-1650 Super Combo was able to outpace the 780M by 23% and the 760M by 36%. On the other hand, the R5-1660 Combo outpaces the 780M by 39% and the 760M by 53%. However, both the 760M and the 780M outperform the R3 1050 Ti combo by 30 and 43% respectively. Considering that both the two APUs can cost $109 to $209 more, it's not exactly amazing value for the iGPUs here. Now moving on to 1080p, we start to become a lot more GPU limited. As you can see in Cyberpunk at 1080p, again at the low preset, the 1660 combo here just delivers a much more better experience than the two APUs here. And even the 12100F combination picks up a bit here, because again we are GPU limited. So our 1.1% lows are a bit elevated compared to 720p. And as you can see here, the 1050 Ti combination is still struggling, delivering worse performance than the two APUs, at least in average and 1% lows. But it kind of does go toe to toe with the 760M in terms of 0.1% lows. Forza Horizon 5 at 1080p at the medium preset with TAA. You can see the difference between these two are pretty small because again, we're GPU limited. So the actual difference between these two GPUs are starting to get smaller and smaller. Though we are still kind of CPU limited here as our 1 and 0.1% lows are considerably lower compared to the 1660 combo. But again, it's higher 1 and 0.1% lows than the 780M and 760M, means the 1650 Super is going to give you a better experience and arguably a much better value here. Now Rainbow Six Siege 1080p with the low preset, no anti-aliasing, the 1660 delivers a monumental performance leap over the two APUs and arguably is just a way, way better experience for this game. And this time around, the 1050Ti combination is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the 760M, so that's pretty impressive. The 1650 Super combination does deliver a higher average FPS here, but it seems the 1.1% 1 .1 lows are pretty low here. Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p with the lowest preset, you can see pretty much the same rule applies with GPU limited here, so the difference between these two in terms of average FPS is pretty small, and even our 1% 1 .1 lows are pretty close to each other as well. But once again, both these combinations are going to give you a much better experience here. But again, it's not like these two APUs are a terrible experience or anything. Like you can see that massive difference between Intel's UHD 770 compared to the 780M and 760M. So these are still seriously impressive iGPUs that they've got on these CPUs. And Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p with the medium preset with TAA enabled. The 1660 combination is the absolute king here, absolutely destroying the two APUs and the 1650 Super combination provides excellent value here. While the 1050 Ti goes toe to toe pretty much to the 760M. Average FPS confirms that the 1650 Super combination outpaces the 760M and 780M by 59 and 38% respectively. The 1660 combination, on the other hand, outperformed the 760M and 780M by 73 and 50% respectfully. The 1050 Ti combination does once again get smoked by the 760M and 780M by 20 and 39% respectively. Now let's compare each of these combinations and APUs in performance per dollar charts. Now keep in mind this doesn't include the cost of the motherboards or the RAM. This is literally just the CPU and GPU. So obviously motherboard options and RAM options are obviously going to play a part in which one that you're purchasing. This is just to give a general idea on the value in terms of these on their own. So you can see each of the three GPU CPU combinations deliver way more value compared to the two APUs, which isn't surprising. Even though the 1050 Ti half the, well not half the time, pretty much all the time was losing to the APUs, it still provides a better value here. And now efficiency is going to be better on these CPUs, obviously, but it's not really something that you should really care about because as you can see in power consumption, even our most performant combination here, the 5600X and 1660, only draws 163 watts. Like that's barely anything. Literally high-end CPUs alone nowadays will draw more power than these two combined. 
so it's not something you should care about. So now we're going to go ahead and show some upscaling performance. Now I could just show FSR 2 on all the different GPUs and APUs, but instead I'm going to use the FSR 3 frame generation mod, specifically Luke FC's FSR 3 frame generation mod, which basically swaps frame generation or FSR 2 with FSR 3 frame generation. Now keep in mind, this obviously isn't going to be representative of what it's actually like using official FSR 3, but it's just to give you an idea in some of these games. For example, it's going to have a lot of different glitches, crashes, and it's also going to have various HUD glitches, like the HUD will literally have a freaky fuckfest, because it's generating frames on top of literally everything, including the HUD. It also performs best when you have at least 60 FPS, which is basically the same for every frame generation technology. And as you can see in Cyberpunk 2077, that's 720p with upscaling, with the upscalers at the balance, at the low preset, you can see pretty much all the APUs and GPUs are stacked on top of one another. But the 1660 combination performs the best here, still providing the best 1.1% lows. And you can see the 780M and 760M outperform the 1050Ti by quite a bit here. But the 0.1% lows seem to be a bit better when it comes to the 1050Ti combination. Although that doesn't speak for its overall fluidity when it comes to frame generation. The 1050Ti and 3100's actual FPS would be around like 50, not exactly, but around 50, which means you're getting less than 60 FPS, which means I wouldn't really recommend using Absolute 3 frame generation. But here it seems to do a pretty good job of getting the 760M and 780M up closer to the 1650 Super, but not quite to the level of the 1660 combination here. You can see Red Dead Redemption 2 is pretty much the same as well. But an interesting thing to point out is that the 1% lows are seriously a lot better here compared to the 1650 Super combination on the two APUs. Again, the 1660 combination is going to provide the best experience here. And on average in the two games at 720p using the FSR 3 mod, you can see the 1650 Super combination outperforms the 760M and 780M by 18 and 10% respectively, while the 1660 combination outperforms the 760M and 780M by 38 and 29% respectively. But the 760M and 780M combinations outperform the 1050 Ti by 56 and 67% respectively. 1080p is up next and at the low preset and cyberpunk with the upscaler against at the balance. Once again the 1660 combination tops the chart with the 1650 super combination following a close second here. The two APUs perform admirably and they get seriously close to the 1650 super combination. It's really impressive to see performance like this on APUs. In Red Dead 2, with the lowest preset, upscales at the balance, at 1080p, pretty much the same thing can be said. But in this game in particular, the 1650 Super and 1660 take a massive lead over the two APUs here. Again, the APUs are still performing admirably and they are performing the 1050 Ti combo. And an average of PS, the 1650 Super combination outperforms the 760M and 780M by 38% and 25% respectively. The 1660 combo outperforms the 760M and 780M by 48 and 34% respectively, while the 760M and 780M outperform the 1050Ti combo again by 51 and 68% respectively. Now let's get into some benchmarks. Starting SOP in the Puget Bench benchmark for Premiere Pro, we can see unsurprisingly at this point, the 1660 takes the hold of both the APUs, well the 780M actually gets pretty close to the 1650 Super combination, but the 1650 Super combination outperforms the 760M, and the 1050 Ti combination falls short of the two APUs, which is again unsurprising. But the 8700G and 780M is holding up a good fire here. Now After Effects, surprisingly the 13500 with the UHD 770 managed to beat out literally all the APUs and GPU CPU combinations, I did not expect that. But CPU performance plays a huge part in this, and the 14 cores and the 13500 is definitely helping it beat all the other options here. The 8700G and 780M are at a close second here with the 8600G, and the three combinations all fall short of the two APUs. In SpecViewPerf, we see a trend similar to the gaming performance here, as the 1660 takes the crown as the best performance in all three of the applications, with the 1650 close second, but the APUs are showing strong performance here, beating the 1050 Ti combination, which shows their excellent 3D rendering performance here. But again, a dedicated GPU is going to give you a lot more performance in these applications. Now as for overclocking on the 780M more specifically, we overclocked the 780M from 2900MHz to 3150MHz, 
and we've roughly achieved a 7% increase across all the games at 1080p. Now keep in mind we're going to make more videos on overclocking, not only the iGPU but also the RAM, as well as the CPU, as well as trying out things like AFMF or Fluid Motion Frames to get the most out of the 8700G and its iGPU. So overall, how does the 780M and the 8700G stack up to some CPU and GPU combinations you can get used on eBay? Well, first of all, system RAM speed is going to have a major impact on iGP performance, like I said. Now, we didn't end up testing that today. I'll probably have that in a future video comparing different RAM speeds on these iGPUs. But it relies solely on system RAM, so you better hope that you have some fast RAM here if you want the most performance out of it. Now, at 720p and 1080p, these are excellent performance, not gonna lie. They absolutely surprise me when it comes to their performance. Being able to beat a 1050 Ti and 3100 is something that's really impressive on just an APU alone. That just shows how far we've gotten in terms of iGPU performance, especially on AMD. But again, in terms of value, these cannot stack up to those used combinations, not at all. Even though the 1050 Ti performed worse than these two iGPUs, you're still going to get better value. And overall, the 1200F 1650 Super and 5600F 1660 combos are just much better in terms of performance, especially on the 1660 combination. We observed much higher 1 and 0.1% lows, which made the gaming experience all the much more better than these APUs. Now, of course, efficiency is something to consider as well. But when our most performant combination here only draws 160 watts, it doesn't really matter all that much. But if you care about efficiency so much, then the 8700G and 8600G are going to be better when it comes to that. So overall, what would I recommend? Is it better to go for something like an 8700G or go for some of these used combinations? Well, really the only reasons why you would go for something like the 8700G is because of upgradability. The AM5 socket is a brand new socket, remember? And AMD is planning to have many more CPU releases with AM5 socket, which means getting something like the 8700G could make sense when it comes to that. But there's still upgradability when it comes to AM4 and LGA 1700. Like for example, later on down the line you can upgrade the 5600X to a 5800X 3D and upgrade your GPU alongside that, and you get a lot more performance, while spending not that much more money to be honest. And on the LG1700 side, you've got plenty of upgradability when it comes to that. You could upgrade that 1200F to maybe a 13th gen chip like a 13400F and also potentially upgrade your GPU later on down the line as well. And upgradability on the AM5 platform is good and all, but in terms of GPU upgradability if you don't want to upgrade your CPU, it's not really all that great, as the 8700G and 8600G are limited to PCIe 4.0 x8. Which, if I'm being honest, doesn't really have a huge impact, but it's still an impact nonetheless, that'll kind of limit your GPU upgradability here. So the only other reason why you would go for an 8700G or 8600G is because of the efficiency when it comes to gaming. But, like I said, it's negligible. With something like a GPU-CPU combination like the ones that we tested, the power consumption wasn't really all that much higher. Anyways guys, that's all for today. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also make sure to check out this video, where we try full motion frames in some of the most popular Steam games.